What I'm trying to do is, is really uh, make people in the West see a version of themselves in these pictures, in these portraits, in these stories. He says the role of the artist is to counteract state propaganda. After photographing Ukraine and its people for years, Mark Neville moved from London to Kiev in 2020. When war broke out, he decided to stay in his adopted country, and he joins us now from Lots in Poland. Thank you, Mark, for being with us today. Uh, now, if I understand correctly, you left your home in Kiev uh, to travel to Lviv, which is in the western part of Ukraine near the Polish border, and now you're in Lots, so that's in, in Poland. How were things in Lviv uh, before you uh, before you moved to Poland? It was a war zone. I mean, we had sirens even in Lviv. Um, we had people being attacked. We had um, curfew. Uh, I guess everything started, you know, the day of the invasion. I live in central Kiev, um, and I woke up about six in the morning to the sound of explosions and sirens going off, and I immediately realized that the... Uh, the long build-up to the war had actually manifested now. And then we had a, me and my partner, Lucaria, we had a really long, agonizing day trying to decide whether to stay in Kiev in our home or to, or to go west towards Lviv, which was considered to be a bit safer. And then about five o'clock in the evening on that, on that first day of the invasion, I got a phone call from a friend of mine who works in the Ukrainian Ministry of Foreign Affairs saying, We've had very sound intelligence that there's going to be a rocket, a missile strike on the presidential home in Kiev. And actually, it sounds very posh. It's not. We live about 50 metres away from the presidential home. So we decided we had to go as well. And that's what we did. We just grabbed bags, you know, whatever we felt was essential. So I had to leave most of my camera kit behind, most of my possessions, and my partner did too. And we drove. We drove for 24 hours solid um, to get to Lviv. Eventually got across the border to Poland about two nights ago because my priority has been this past week to get my partner, to get my woman safe in Poland. And that's where we are now in a town called Lodz. But I'm actually going to return to Ukraine in a, in a day or so to deliver some medical supplies to friends and also to try and persuade them to leave because I don't think it's safe. It's good to hear that you're, you're safe uh, in, in Poland. Um, as, a, as a photographer, have you been taking uh, photos of what's been going on around you or has your priority really been to try and, and get yourself out of, out of Ukraine? I've been in conflict zones before. I worked in Helmand, Afghanistan for three months with the British troops 10 years ago. But I, when I was doing that work, I always knew I had a safe space, my home in London, to go back to. And that's incredibly reassuring. and It gives you a sense of security. In Ukraine, I've simultaneously tried to be documenting events through various means. And at the same time, I've experienced displacement myself. Mm. So that kind of safety blanket that you have as a war reporter or a photographer, as an artist, where you know it's temporary is now gone. Not only that, I've, myself and my friends have had the trauma, and it is the most profound trauma you can imagine, of having witnessed our, our, our streets being destroyed, mm. our communities being destroyed, people dying, people being made homeless, uh, and there's nothing really to prepare yourself for that feeling. So I've been trying to push on all fronts uh, and also release my book. Yes. <laughs> uh, Stop Tanks with Books, which has been in the making for six years and which actually went to print and the first hundred copies of which were disseminated literally four days before the war began. Well, you mentioned your book, Stop Tanks with, with, with uh, Books. So it's a series of, of portraits of, of people in Ukraine that you've been working on for, for years, as you mentioned. <laughs> Did you see these things spiralling out of control? Is this something that, that shocked you or, or, was, it, was, or was it just as a complete surprise? Totally. Totally, I saw them spiralling out of control. And if I could see them, and I'm not a military or political strategist, then other people saw this coming. They must have seen it coming. And this is what really upsets me and annoys me. You know, the Russian invasion started in 2014. I started making my book 
about the war in 2016. And the idea was always to make this book called Stop Tanks with Books, to send it out in a targeted free dissemination mm. to diplomats, uh, members of parliament, politicians, celebrities, negotiators, people at NATO, people in the EU, anyone who I thought had it in their power to somehow help Ukraine. And I always urged in the book, even from the start, for deterrence mm. against the Russian threat. In other words, let Ukraine join NATO, let Ukraine join EU, deter Russia, very strict sanctions against Russia. So I've had this book in the pipeline for five years. I've been making portraits of Ukrainians. And, you know, the book, uh, I was let down one by one publisher, finally found a second one in November 2020, about a month or two after I moved house and home to, to Kiev from London. And basically, Nazareli Press in California and I have been working every single night for 10 weeks leading up to the invasion, trying to get this book finished. It's in three languages in one book, English, Russian and Ukrainian, trying to get the book finished and disseminated to this target audience. So it's all about trying to have an impact with a photo book, because I really believe that photo books, people have an emotional connection to them. And these are the things that change people's opinions about a war, even politicians' opinions about a war. It's these emotional bits of cultural connection. You know, it might be a poem about World War I or it might be a pop song about Vietnam, but these are the things that really connect with even the people who make these big decisions. And you've, you've, so mentioned, yeah, you've mentioned that you really hope that people will have an emotional connection, uh, as you mentioned, when, when they're looking at the mm -hmm. photos in this book, uh, that they'll see a version of themselves in these portraits, why is it so important, yes. you think, for people to recognize themselves in these kind of portraits? It's absolutely essential because the Kremlin has been pumping out this racist disinformation and fake news about Ukrainians since 2014. They've been saying, you know, Ukraine is a fascist state, for example. Well, how is that possible? We have a Ukrainian, uh, we have a, a Jewish president, amongst other things. I mean, it's really one of the most religiously tolerant countries in the world, Ukraine. And yet people in the West have decided because of the, I don't know, the miscalculation of people in Western media and press to perpetuate these myths. So a lot of these Kremlin-based myths have been perpetuated by Western media and press, unfortunately. And so, of course, we in the West, we have a completely distorted view of Ukrainians. And part of the aim of the book was not only to try and stop the war, which, as I say, we, we had a finished version of the book ready years ago to go, urging for exactly the same things we're urging for now. It's not only to try and stop the war, it was also to present a, a truthful depiction of who Ukrainians are. So what I've tried to do in the book is not only use my photographs that I've taken all over Ukraine for the past five or six years, but I've also combined them with ethnographic research by the Centre for Eastern European Studies in Berlin about the political and social views of some of the 2.5 million people who were already displaced by the war by 2017. Mm. It's also combined with short stories from this incredible Ukrainian writer called Luva Yakimchuk, who describes what it's like to live in Russian-occupied Donbass in 2014. And I'm telling you, it's not a pleasant regime. People were tortured, still being tortured, kidnapped, set on fire in the streets. I mean, it's really brutal stuff. And I've also combined those different types of text and information with a call to action for the international community and my own introduction about what it's like to live in Kiev as a guy from Britain, as a guy from the West. Well, in, you know? in your... In so, your collection of books, uh, Stop, Stop Tanks with uh, Books, uh, there's some striking photos of women uh, in particular. Uh, we've seen a lot of Ukrainian women take up arms and show in incredible resilience uh, in the recent days. There's one image in particular uh, that, that's pretty striking. It's called Women Smoking on a Bench in Mirnorad, which is near Donetsk. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a, a bit more about that shot and how, how you got it? Well, I was doing uh, some images about the mining community, a massive mining community in Donbass in the east of Ukraine. And uh, I'd finished taking pictures in the mine and I went to the town centre, a place called Mirnograd, which is about three or four kilometres from the front line. You know, it's very near. And remember, these people have been living with the war for eight years now, constant shelling in the east. And I see this very striking woman sit down on a bench and she's carrying this blue 
portfolio, which I guess has some kind of important documents in it, either, I don't know, a, a lease for, a, for a, an apartment or, or identity papers or something, but she was clearly on a mission. And so I went over, I speak some Russian, most people speak Russian in that part of Ukraine, and I introduced myself, I said, I'm doing a project about normal life in Ukraine, can I take a few pictures of you? And you know, I have quite a big analog camera, plate camera with a huge flash attached to it. So it's, it's, not, it's not subtle, you know, it's, it's kind of very in your face. And um, she was, she, I said, do you mind if I take pictures? And she said, no, no problem. What was remarkable about this woman was she was completely self-possessed, completely in her own thoughts, in her own world, and completely unfazed and unaffected by this English guy with a big camera. And she just lit a cigarette and started to smoke. And she, for me, she just became a symbol of all that's great about Ukraine, you know, this determination, this confidence, this self-possession, like I know who I am, what I'm doing. I've seen it time and time again since I started coming here in 2015. Well, it's an incredible photo from your book, uh, Stop Tanks with Books, which opens with a quote uh, by the German politician Heiko Meis. Uh, if Russia stops fighting, there'll be no war. If Ukraine stops fighting, there'll be no Ukraine. Mark Neville, thank you so much for being with us today on France 24. Please stay safe and, uh, and continue your wonderful work. It's so important for all of us to be seeing these photos uh, coming out of Ukraine. Uh, before we go, I wanted to mention an exhibition here in Paris at the Musée de la Libération de Paris, uh, dedicated to eight women photographers who covered 75 years of international conflicts between 1936 and 2011. It's called Femme Photographe de Guerre. It features photos by Lee Miller, Christine Spengler, Françoise Dumulder, amongst others. And all in all, there are 80 photos showing the implication of women in war zones, whether they're fighting, victims, or witnesses. For more arts and culture news, head to our website and stay in touch on social media. Stay tuned to France 24. More news is coming up right after this.